So the title of the talk is High Order Methods for Empirical Risk Minimization. So this is, uh, you know, 60% uh, the work of Arian, 30% the work of Mark, 10% uh, the work of myself. But I will be talking about it today. So what is the sort of problem that we try to look at, right? So let me give you here a, a brief introduction. So the, 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 the problems that we would like to solve, or at least the problems that I would like to talk about, are statistical risk minimization problems, right? So you have a certain parameter theta. You are trying to find a certain vector w, which somehow minimizes a certain statistical loss, f, with respect to the distribution of theta. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that you don't know the distribution of that uh, unknown parameter theta. So instead of solving that problem, you settle for solving the empirical risk minimization problem, where your goal is, instead of minimizing that statistical loss, is to minimize that empirical sum or that empirical risk, right? Where all of these theta i's have been drawn independently and identically distributed from the distribution theta, okay? Now, that's a very classical setup, but, you know, uh, towards the end of the talk, I do want you to remember that the sort of problems that we want to solve is not empirical risk. I mean, the sort of problems that we want to solve are a statistical risk minimization problems, okay? And there is, you know, a relationship between these two and that we should try to exploit that relationship to make the solutions of these problems more interesting. But in any event, right, so for the time being, let us perhaps forget about the statistical loss and just focus on solving this empirical loss minimization problem. The challenge, of course, is that in modern days, this number n is extremely large. The p, which is the size of this parameter, may be large as well. But let us just focus on the problem of n being very large. Now, when n is very large, right, so we cannot handle that in a single computer. We cannot handle that in a single iteration. So we do two things, or actually just one thing if you want. We distribute this problem across a space and time, right? So you consider a bunch of servers, a bunch of points in time, and at each, and at each server and at each point in time, you process a different set of functions, okay? So you have a certain function here, f11, that lives in server one at time one, a function f12 that lives in server one at time two, a function here, um, well, so the, the subindices are broken, but this one here would be something like f31, which lives on server three at time one and so on, okay? So, you know, you distribute the optimization problem, again, across space and time, and you attempt to solve. Now, the fundamental problem that I would like to address here today is this, right? Is that, well, you know, when you distribute across time, you call these problems stochastic. When you distribute across space, you call these problems decentralized. But we don't really have a scalable online methods. We have some attempts at doing this uh, distributed methods scalable. But in terms of online optimization, we don't really have methods that are very scalable. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, let us focus here about these stochastic methods, okay? So in these stochastic methods, you have subsets of samples that are used at each iteration, right? That's, uh, what, that's what I mean by distribute, distributing across time. So at each point in time, we have access or we choose to access a different subset of, uh, of functions. Well, you know, the most popular method, and this is actually perhaps surprising, right? I mean, still, the most popular method to solve these problems is stochastic gradient descent, right? The stochastic gradient descent is a 70, maybe 80-year-old algorithm. We know it has lots of problems, but it's still the most popular choice to solve these uh, sort of problems. Now, what is the problem with SGD? Well, SGD is very slow, and it is very slow for two reasons, right? The first one is because it's gradient descent, right? And stochastic um, and gradient descent is not going to be very efficient when you have a problem whose curvature is not nice, right? Meaning when you have a problem that is not well conditioned. The other reason why this is a very slow method is because you have noise in your gradient, right? That's why the gradient is called stochastic. Okay, now in recent years, there has been a lot of effort in trying to reduce or to mitigate these two problems separately. There has been uh, many papers that list with variance reduction. These are go, go on by the names of SAG, SAGA, SVRG. The goal here is to use some technique to reduce the noise of the gradient. I will talk a little bit more about that later. The other, the other sort of, um, you know, the other sort of uh, literature deals with handling 
not the issue of noise in the gradient, but the fact that the gradient is not a very good descent direction, okay? And those go mostly under the name of stochastic quasi-Newton methods, and here you have a few of the mnemonics that are involved, right? These are things like, a, a, you know, these are stochastic ver versions of BFGS. This one is regularized stochastic BFGS. There's online limited memory BFGS and so on. So there's, there's a few variants here. Let's, let's not get lost on the, on the, on the mnemonics. Now, uh, you know, just for completeness, I mean, there's a bunch of things in terms of decentralized methods, but, you know, I'm not gonna be uh, talking about those today. And there is something I'm gonna talk about at the end of the talk, which, about, which is about adaptive sam sample size methods, okay? But at the end of the day, I mean, the message that I want to transpire in these first a few minutes of the talk is that when you want to solve these large scale optimization problems, you distribute them across either time or space. In either case, the solutions that we have, they are still based in gradient descent, okay? So there is a very important research direction here, which is how to devise methods for either stochastic or decentralized optimization that utilize high order information. What I am gonna be talking today is not about the decentralized case, but about the stochastic case and how you can come up with efficient way of exploiting that second order information. Okay, let me therefore go into the first uh, um, section of the talk, which is about incremental quasi-Newton algorithms. And I repeat, right, so the problem that I am trying to handle here is to resolve the twin challenge of stochastic gradient descent. The twin challenge being the noise in the, gra in the stochastic gradient and the fact that the gradient is not a very good descent direction. Now, I've been talking a lot about gradient descent, right, so uh, in case one of you doesn't know what it is, the point is that if you go back to the original problem that I have, right, which is this problem here, then it would be very easy to find these gradients. It's just, you know, it's just the sum of the individual gradients of each function, but it would be very difficult to compute that gradient because that would require capital N times P operation, right? So you don't do that. So instead of that, you, se you select a certain subset, <coughs> a certain subset of capital L functions, Capital L typically being something like one, but you know, doesn't need to be one. And uh, you know, you evaluate the gradients for these capital L functions, you sum those up and you call that thing your incremental or stochastic gradient. Now, then instead of descending along your gradient, you descend along your stochastic gradient. Okay, so that, you know, I am, um, you know, I should I should apologize for offending your intelligence. I'm sure you, that you all of, all of you need, uh, know this, but I am mostly introducing the notation here. Okay, now, what is the problem with this, right? Well, uh, or actually, before the problem, right? I mean, this algorithm will converge. Why will it converge? Because if you take the expected value of this, the expected value of this is that, so in average, you're moving in the right, in the right direction, so eventually you will reach the mean. What is the problem with this? Well, is that this is very slow, right? What would you like to do to solve that slowness you would like to use Newton, right? But, you know, Newton here is impractical. So if Newton is impractical, what do you uh, resort to is to stochastic BFGS, uh, to stochastic quasi-Newton methods. Now, before I talk about stochastic quasi-Newton methods, let me talk a little bit more about this incremental gradient descent algorithm. Now, an incremental gradient descent algorithm, right? So, you know, this is a stochastic gradient descent in incremental gradient descent, we are going to utilize memory to reduce the variance of the stochastic gradients. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, uh, let us have here some history of past gradient evaluation. So here I have function f1, function f2, function fn, and so on. At each point in time, I will select one of these functions. I could either select them at random or I could select them cyclically. I will be using cyclic order in today just because it's easier for the derivations, but that really doesn't matter, right? But anyways, at a, some point in time, I select one of these functions, I evaluate the gradient, and I update that gradient in my table. Now, instead of descending along the regular gradient descent, 
I am going to descend along this history average of gradients, okay? So have here gradients of the function f1, f2, f3, all the way through fn. I take the average of those and I descend along that direction, okay? Okay, now I have to emphasize something very important here, okay? Which is that all of these gradients, except this one, they have been computed in the wrong place, okay? So here, you know, this gradient of the function fit is being evaluated at the current iterate. But this here has been evaluated at some point in the past, okay? Nevertheless, this algorithm can be shown to work, and it has a very important advantage relative to stochastic gradient descent. And that very important advantage is that this algorithm converges linearly, whereas stochastic gradient descent converges at a sublinear rate, okay? Now, so let me repeat or summarize the important points, okay? So gradients, they don't work. They're just too computational intensive. We could use stochastic gradients. Actually, it's not that we could use. We use stochastic gradients. I mean, by we, I mean society or, or our, our species, right? That's, that's our workhorse methodology to solve these optimization problems. This is, however, very slow for two reasons, right? The first one being that the noise here is too large. In order to reduce the effect of noise, people have devised these incremental methods, okay, in which we keep a history of past gradients. And keeping that history, although it may seem like a bad idea, right, because I am using information that is outdated, that actually improves the convergence property of the algorithms, and that can be proven theoretically, because the convergence rate of these methods is linear, not sublinear, as is the case of stochastic gradient descent. Now, the other problem that I mentioned, right, is that of curvature. So um, when we talk about curvature, you know, Newton here would be impractical. So what would be perhaps a better idea is to use something like a quasi-Newton method, okay? Now, how does a quasi-Newton method work? Well, you know, if you remember your Newton, right, so you put an inverse matrix in there, which in the case of Newton would be the Hessian inverse, and that thing pre-multiplies the gradient. Okay, now, that's complicated, right? As I said, I mean, Newton is not uh, easy to do. In a stochastic quasi, uh, sorry, in quasi-Newton methods, what we do is we replace that Hessian by a certain matrix BT. And that matrix BT is chosen to satisfy what is called the secant condition, okay? So let me try to explain that because that's somewhat important. So that second condition says the following. So you look at the variable variation, meaning how much the variables have changed between time t and t plus one. You look at how much the gradients have changed between t and t plus one, okay? And then you know that the Hessian has to satisfy this equation in the limit, right? That these things approach each other. Well, then you say, instead of, you know, since the Hessian, I don't know it, let me select a function bt here that I will choose it to satisfy this condition, okay? Why am I saying that? Well, because, you know, I am hoping that if I find a matrix that satisfies this condition, I am going to find a matrix that will be close to the Hessian, okay? And indeed, I mean, that can be done. You just need to be aware of the fact that there's a dimensionality problem here, right? So here are n constraints. This matrix B has n square unknowns. So you also add the condition that the matrix BT and BT plus one have to be close. You know, that closeness comes in the form of, um, uh, of a minimum entropy condition. Doesn't matter what it is. Thing is, is that this thing can be computed in closed form, okay? So you have this sort of update here, which again, I don't want you to even look at its form much, just for one uh, particular detail. But, you know, what we know is that asymptotically, this BT matrix is converging towards the Hessian and here convergence, you know, I am talking about that in a, in a conditional way, which I will not specify, okay? But uh, that, that's, again, not important. Now, the thing is this, right? Those, these methods are known to converge at a super linear rate, okay? Okay, now, so, right? So let's go back to what I have said, right? So the stochastic gradient, that's a slow because of noise and because of conditioning. Let me, therefore, resolve the noise problem using incremental gradients. 
and let me use the curvature problem using stochastic quasi-Newton methods. Right? Therefore, let me propose an stochastic incremental quasi-Newton method. And ideally, I would like these methods to have superlinear convergence. Okay? How would I do that? So, well, you know, let us go back again to our memory diagram. Okay, in our memory diagram here, we were just keeping tracks of gradients. Let me now also emphasize that, you know, we should be keeping track of variables as well, right? So that, that I didn't say it, but it was implicit, right? So we're keeping tracks of gradients, therefore we're keeping track of variables as well, right? So we have all of our history of variables, gradients, and matrices B. We use that updated variable to update just one gradient, and we use all of these things to update just one matrix B, okay? This is a straightforward generalization of this diagram. In this diagram, we update a gradient. In this diagram here, we update the variable, the gradient, and the matrix B. Now, how do we update these things, okay? So that's, that's how the structure of the algorithm will work out. So how do we update these things? Well, you know, the first one is how do we update the matrices B? In order to update the matrices B, I will repeat the same update that I use here, except that I will just use the proper variables and gradients, okay? Now, the thing that is interesting is how do I update the variables W, right? So let me again, so this is, I'm sorry for the back and forth, but this is, I have found the best way of explaining these things. So I repeat, right, so we want to do a method that is incremental quasi-Newton, right? So to do that, we need to update the variables, the gradients, and the matrices B. Huh? What is? Where is B here? So W is the optimization variable, right? That will use optimization variable, yes. And so what are the Z? <coughs> the Z's, the Z's is a generic, the Z here is a, so this W here is representing the current variable. Right. And I am using Z to represent the W, but when I refer to their history. Okay, so the Z's are just W. So the, 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 the thing that I have to assert here, uh, Alec, is that this, this is like super T, right? right? So what I am saying is, you know, I am up updating all of this, but that's just to keep the consistency of the notation. Okay, so I have to update the C's, the B's, the gradients, right? So, but only one of them at a time, though. That's also very important. Now, you know, the W's uh, are the ones that I still have not talked about. Updating the gradient, that is trivial. Updating the B, this is not trivial, but I am using this same expression, okay? So this is a straightforward BFGS update. Now, how do I update the W's? Well, I mean, what you would like to do is go back to that equation, right? And then... You look at the sum of the b's, you take the inverse of that, you look at the sum of the gradients, that's your incremental gradient, this is your incremental matrix B, and you perform this update. Now, this is interesting, okay? But in retrospective, and for reasons that I will explain very soon, this is a choice that in hindsight is naive. As a matter of fact, this is not my proposal. I mean, there is a paper uh, where this is uh, where this is put forth as a method. But in that paper, what they show is that this method achieves linear convergence. Now, going through all this trouble to recover the same convergence rate that you have with incremental gradient descent, right? That's just a fancy way of acknowledging that the method doesn't work. Now, why is it that the method doesn't work? Well, so what you have to remember here is that, yes. What's the, what's the problem dependent constant in the linear rate though? Like, do you, so in, in incremental, I guess you'll get square root of condition number over yes. plus uh, Very good. one type of thing, right? So what, what, what do you get here in the linear rate? Right, so you get a constant that is actually worse than the constant for gradient descent in theory. Uh, in practice, you get much, in practice, you get convergence that is much better. But in theory, you get a warranty that is worse. 
But that's a limitation of the analysis. I can tell you later why, why that, that is the case. Now, the point is this, right? So why do I say that this, well, actually, the point is this, right? I mean, this is a choice that I'm calling naive. Why am I calling it naive? Well, because after you realize that it doesn't work, you think about this, right? Well, optimization updates, they're always coming from the solution of some optimization, uh, of some uh, quadratic approximation, right? So what is the quadratic that we are minimizing here? And if you do the inverse here, right? I mean, the quadratic function that you're minimizing is this one, which again, right? I mean, it's a complicated expression, but I just want you to follow the colors here. Because when you look at the colors, what you observe is this, is that the gradients you are evaluating at zi, which I should be grateful for Alex's question, right? I mean, the zi's here are those that you have kept in the history. However, the secant condition b is also verified as zi, but the quadratic form that you are using is centered at wt, okay? So I repeat, right, these zi's, these are the things that you have kept track of in memory. So when you write this Taylor series, this Taylor series between quotes and quotes, you are evaluating the gradients at CI, you are evaluating this Hessian at CI as well, but the Taylor series is centered at W. So that thing over there is the minimizer, not of a Taylor series, I mean, it's the minimizer of a quadratic that just doesn't make any sense. What you should do is you should center these things in the same place, right? Instead of centering the quadratic at some point and doing the linear, the quadratic approximation at a different point, you do the quadratic approximation at the same place where you have centered your quadratic function. Now this is now a reasonable Taylor series. You take the minimum of this and you end up deriving this update. Now this update looks very different from the one before. It looks very difficult to implement, but I should emphasize that this is something that can be computed in order p squared operations, which is the same number of operations that you need to implement this update. Okay, so this is actually a bona fide uh, incremental BFGS methods in which the number of operations that you need to do per iteration are p squared independently of n, right? So this is a true incremental method. Okay, now let me, let me uh, go back and re-emphasize the important points of what I said, okay? So I started looking here at stochastic gradient descent, right? I said this thing is slow because of noise, and this thing is slow because of ill condition. To handle noise, we don't really need to invent anything, actually, right? We just reuse incremental uh, ideas. To reduce the problems that arise with condition numbers, we could use BFGS. The challenge arises in combining these things. And the challenge, actually, does not arise in combining these two things because you can come up with a very simple architecture and you can come up with a very simple update that exploits that architecture. I am just leveraging memory in variables, matrices, and gradients, and leveraging this memory allows me to write this update. Problem is that this update will not achieve superlinear convergence, and it does not achieve superlinear convergence because this method is not constructing a proper Taylor series. But once you realize that, you can construct the proper Taylor series, you can come up with the right update, and once you have this, it's not difficult uh, neither surprising that it is possible to show some form of superlinear convergence, okay? So this statement here, if you look at the thing on top, is wt minus w star, what you have on the denominator, what you have in the numerator is wt minus w star, what you have in the denominator, uh, this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, an average of the last capital N iterates, okay? And that thing is going to zero. That means that this thing here is going to zero faster than this, which means that this thing is going to zero at a superlinear rate. You know, if you are a stickler for simple results, uh, you know, um, you know, we, it's, it is uh, not difficult to leverage this into a result that uh, establishes a superlinear convergence in the usual sense of wt minus w star divided just by wt minus one minus w star. 
but this, this is actually stronger than that. Okay, now uh, this is in terms of theory, so how does this work in practice? Well, you know, that, that will depend on the condition number, of course, right? I mean, if we look at a problem, which here I call one of them a small condition number, the other one large condition number, uh, you can see, well, you know, these are things like SAG, SAGA. These are the ones that are not using, um, that are not using uh, a BFGS correction. The method that we propose that uses this BFGS correction converges at a, uh, at a much faster rate. I should clarify though, right, that what I call here a small condition number is actually 10 to the two, and what I call large condition number is 10 to the four. So the small is not that small, right? This, this could be maybe large and super large. But the idea here is to illustrate, right, that the gains are, in a sense, whatever you want to make them. So if you have a problem in which the condition number is close to zero, uh, so, uh, close, to, <laughs> close to one, you shouldn't go through the trouble of doing any of this. But if you have moderate or large condition numbers, there is uh, a lot to be gained through uh, the use of this uh, methodology. Yes. So on the theory side, I guess a lot of the previous results have uh, just required the average function to be strongly convex instead of the individual ones, but if I understood correctly, you're requiring the individual ones. Yes, that's a, that, that, that's a very good question, right? So the question here is, what are the assumptions in the theorem, which I, 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 I did not specify because of uh, time limitations, but in this theorem, the individual functions are required to be M strongly convex and the gradients are required to be M Lipschitz continuous, and the individual Hessians are required to be L Lipschitz uh, continuous. So that, that assumption is stronger than the assumption that, <laughs> that, the assumption that, uh, that appears in uh, regular stochastic gradient descent or incremental, incremental gradient descent. This is, however, a second order method, so it's not unreasonable that a condition like this has to appear. And then, um, uh, in the, in, I guess in the, experiments that you were showing, I was curious how the total running time actually compares if you look at not the number of iterations. Correct, correct. So the, the, another very important point that Alec raises here is the issue of P, right? What is the dimensionality? So, and as you are probably going to guess, right, if we look at problems in which P is very large, then the gains in conversion time do not pay off in terms of gains, uh, no, so the gains in convergence iterations, right, do not translate into gains in convergence time. So that's, that's another very important clarification, right? So what actually, you know, uh, in this particular case, I mean, the convergence time is gonna be much faster because we are looking at a problem of moderate complexity. Uh, but the point that should be emphasized here is this, right? So what is the sort of problems where this is justified, right? These are problems where P is moderate and where the, um, where the uh, condition number is very large. So you're not playing around with any limited memory version of this? We, that's another excellent point. Uh, instead, of, instead of looking at this idea, you could try to derive a limited memory version of this. Uh, So uh, let me see if I can explain limited memory versions relatively quickly. So in limited memory versions, instead of keeping history of the last capital N, that is instead of keeping a full past history of matrices B, you would keep track of just a few of them. You would just keep track of the last capital L of them, something like that. Well, uh, if you do that, it is possible to rearrange, so, so what, I'm, what I'm gonna tell you is the following, Alec. It is possible to rearrange this iteration in a way that takes L times P uh, computations per iteration. What we have not been able to do, however, is to be able to rearrange this computation in a way that will tell you L times P operations. So we do have a limited version, limited memory version of this. We have been playing with that. It helps you in terms of memory storage, right? Because this is also costly to store, but it doesn't help you in terms of operations. So that's one of the th things that is still puzzling us, whether it is possible to rearrange a limited memory version of this into something that is more computationally practical. Maybe the other thing people are trying to do in order to address the storage and uh, update complexity for Newton is instead 
of going the VFGS route, they've gone like various kinds of scheduling. Correct, right. yes. So have you looked at comparisons with that at all? Uh, what Alec is saying is that another way of dealing with this problem would be not to use BFGS here, but to use some sort of some some modification some modification of Newton, and trying to do some uh, sketching on the. Uh, I should not use the sketching. I mean, a, a different word for sketching is to do in some limited sample size approximation of that. So we have look at these problems as well. So the the. The thing is this, right? So the moment you introduce an approximation here in Newton, eventually the noise of that will dominate and you will not achieve any form of superlinear conversions, right? So the, the, thing, the thing that is very interesting here is that through the use of memory, you are actually converging towards the Hessian, okay? And that convergence towards the Hessian is what allows you to claim superlinear conversions. So this is more efficient than any of these uh, sketch Newton versions for that for that reason, this is not to say that, but it's still interesting to analyze whether it is possible to rearrange these uh, algorithms into some that has a superlinear convergence. Okay, so it's here that I have 10 minutes, no? Huh? Oh, okay, but you already answered all my questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there, there, there was a person who before this talk told me that I was not gonna have enough time to describe this properly, so, but I will try to describe this properly. So let's, let's go back and talk about a completely different way of doing things, okay? So in stochastic methods, we divide across the space. In, um, in decentralized methods, we, dis, uh, we distribute across, uh, sorry, in stochastic methods, we distribute across time. In decentralized methods, we distribute across the space. Let us look about at something different here. And to look at that something different, let us go back to the statistical loss problem that I uh, pointed at the beginning of the talk. In the statistical loss problem, we are trying to arg minimize this expectation, okay? But that was the problem that we considered infeasible. And for that reason, we replaced that by this empirical risk minimization problem. But the point is this, right? So this W star, that's the statistical list, the statistical loss minimizer. This W dagger sub n, that's the minimizer of the empirical risk, which means that you don't really want to solve this to infinite accuracy, right? Because this is an approximation of the thing you want to solve. You don't really need a perfect solution. You need a solution that has some accuracy. And this is actually well known, right? So if you go into Babnik, into Babnik and Cherbonenki's original work, they, you will find this definition, right, of the statistical accuracy of empirical risk minimization, which is how good the empirical risk is at minimizing the statistical loss. And that is characterized by a certain constant Vn, which depending on who you ask is one over the square root of n or one over n, okay? So that is not who you ask. I mean, it depends on how strong your assumptions are. But anyways, and these, are, these are things that are well known, right? And what is it? that is important here, well, that there is no need to minimize this one beyond accuracy of order Vn. I mean, this is so well known, right, that in fact, this is the reason why we add regularizers in ERM. Because if you add a regularizer of order Vn, you're gonna be moving the minimum Vn around, right? But, you know, you have the statistical minimizer here, the empirical minimizer here, these two are within Vn, if you add another VN, it doesn't really matter much, right? So that's why you can add a regularizer without loss of optimality. Okay, so the goal therefore here is not to find a minimizer, but to find a minimizer within the statistical accuracy. <coughs> well, if that is your goal, perhaps you can come up with what you can call an adaptive sample size method in which you start growing the sample size, but you don't grow it one at a time, you grow it geometrically. Let's say that you do the following, okay? So you consider little n samples, that is smaller than capital N, you find the arg minimizer, arg minimizer of the empirical risk. <coughs> and you differentiate here, okay, between the minimizer for n samples and the minimizer for m samples. 
what I propose as a method is that we do the following. So we find a solution for the risk Rm. We then increase the sample size to some m larger than m, and we use this Wm as a warm start to find the approximate solution for the other one. Why do I think that this is a good idea? Well, look at these three reasons here, if you, if you don't mind. So the first is this, right? So if you look at the condition number of Rm, it's going to be a smaller than Rn because of the regularizer. So this problem is easier to solve. It is also easier to solve because the required accuracy is larger than the required accuracy for Vm. And the computation cost is also smaller because you have less number of samples, right? So the problem with m number of samples is much easier than the problem with n number of samples because of a better condition number, a lesser accuracy required, and a lesser computational cost. You know, this is perhaps better explained in this picture. So what, what we have is something like this. So we have here a Wn star, but we have a certain, uh, sorry. Um, this is something that I would like to do. How will I do that? Well, let me say that I use Newton to do this, okay? So sorry for this, uh, for this uh, glitch. So what we have here is a certain Wm star with a certain statistical accuracy. And a certain Wn star with another statistical accuracy, which is smaller, right? Because I have increased the sample size. What I propose to do is to utilize only one Newton step between each of these iterations. Is this a good idea? Well, this is a good idea if you assume that the following happens which is that the quadratic convergence rate associated with the problem with n samples includes the minimizer that we found for m samples. Okay, so let me repeat. So this is Wm star. Wm star. I have solved this problem with statistical accuracy, meaning I have found a solution inside of this ball. If this ball here includes this other ball, which is the Newton quadratic convergence region, then in just one iteration, I should be able to come up very close to this other minimizer. Now this is just a problem of finding the right balance, right? So how do you find that right balance? Well, you know, again, let us go through assumptions that we can skip, and let us come up with conditions for this to be the case. And, you know, I know that these two conditions here are, are, are difficult to read. I will simplify them soon. But what these conditions are trying to tell you it's just two things. One is that the Newton quadratic convergence ball of Rn <coughs> is that Wm is in the Newton quadratic convergence rate of Rn, okay? Meaning that the solution that you find for m samples is in the quadratic region for the cost after you increase the sample size. And this second condition here is just saying that Wn is in the statistical accuracy of Rn. Now in the green one, the only thing that I want you to observe is the square. Because the matching here is happening in the blue. Because the blue is a condition that tells you Wm is in the quadratic region for Rn. If that happens, then you have quadratic conversions and this second condition follows very easy. Okay, now what is, what is going on with this uh, constant, right? So, Let's look at the following thing. I mean, when the problem M becomes large, what happens is that this second condition will be redundant because here you have things a square and here you don't have a square. So when M is large, this condition will always be satisfied. So the question is whether this condition is satisfied or not. And in order to do that, let me just take some simplifications, okay? And let me suppose that I am just choosing, yes, two according, but yes, one minute. Um, let me just suppose, okay, that I increase the sample size between n and m by multiplying by a certain constant alpha, okay? If that is the case, then I end up with this more simplified condition when m is very large, okay? And that condition actually just means that I need to chase this regularizing constant c to be larger than two times, you know, like a 16 times two is 16 times four, whatever, you know, a small number multiplied by the condition number, uh, Lipschitz constant 
of the optimization process. Now, uh, you know, this is all uh, that I had to say. I have some uh, conclusions here, but I will skip them in the interest of time. Thank you. Yes. The first order, the first order versions of adaptive sample size. So, uh, yes, you can show that they are better. Than, I don't know if that's a question of statement. No, I, was, I was thinking, I was thinking more on the uh, first part where you talked about this incremental method. Ah, yes. I'm wondering whether uh, you can have this better than the standard PHA. So, for instance, in the first order approach with the incremental algorithm, you, you had a paper that showed. Sure, sure. Yes. No, we don't. We don't. Okay. We, don't we cannot show that this is. Deterministically better than non-incremental version. Yes. Uh, 